All right, 2 Timothy chapter 4. Now, I, I, I don't have something positive for you this morning for Sunday school. Uh, I have something that is factual for you this morning in Sunday school. So it's not meant to be uh, uh, difficult. Wednesday night uh, was very difficult because we talked about, I don't want to be a Demas. A Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. Now, I'm going to show you this morning with a couple of uh, verses here that Demas was Paul's traveling companion, and he's even mentioned with Luke as Paul's traveling command companion. Traveling with Paul and traveling with Luke and he is seeing Paul doing all kind of miracles and seeing Paul with the extended revelation that God gave him and seeing Paul being used among the Gentiles to see people saved and seeing all the great things that transpire in Paul's ministry and partaking of the things that happened to Paul. In 2 Corinthians 11, when he talks about all the perils that are there, Demas is there. When he talks about in jail and in prison, Demas is there. When he talks about shipwrecked and all, Demas is there. When he talks about beatings, Demas is there. Do you know what happens? The things that the persecution, the trouble, and the trials could not do, the world was able to do. That should shock you. That should let you know the strength of the world's pull. Listen, if anybody would want to get out, the trouble that the Apostle Paul went through that he winds up thanking God for and, and saying we glory in tribulation and so on and so forth, those things didn't knock Demas out. The ministry didn't knock Demas out. Demas has no, reckon, uh, no, no uh, comments about the brethren upsetting him or somebody getting mad at him or any of that other kind of stuff. The statement about Demas is very limited. It said, Demas hath forsaken me having loved this present world. Now, that can't be played up enough. That means that more than tribulation, trials, troubles, problems, and things that happened to you, as you after you got saved, that the greatest danger that you can get into is the danger that the world can pull you away from Jesus Christ and break your fellowship with Him. He didn't lose His salvation. But right when Paul was in the position of needing Demas, Demas said, there's something out there in the world that's more appealing to me than being in the ministry. I don't know, maybe he was bitter at the ministry. Maybe he thought the ministry was going to be different. It doesn't say. It just makes a definitive statement that Demas, having loved this present world, hath forsaken me. Father, bless your world and help, help uh, bless your word, please. And uh, don't bless the world, Lord. Uh, bless, uh, bless your word, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I'd be jumped if I'm going to pray, God bless America, when America's living like it is. Come to Matthew chapter number 26. Matthew 26. Now the thing that's, that stands out to me is the, in this is, is the fact that you're given repeated warnings throughout the Bible. The Lord warns you about the, the pull of the world on you. Uh, and yet, uh, unfortunately, there's not much talk about it because I don't think we recognize what that can mean. Your job is in the world. But that's an acceptable thing, right? I mean, if you work really hard and work 60 hours a week, you're industrious. But if you quit your job and go to Bible school and go to the mission field, you're an idiot. If you work really hard and instead of going to church on Sunday, you work double overtime and time and a half in order to be able to get ahead to provide for your family, you're a good father or you're a good mother. But if you say, I don't want the overtime and I'd rather not have the new lawnmower, or I'd rather not have the new truck, I'd rather be in church, you're a fool, you're an idiot. See, the world is not always about lascivious things. Lust is not always sexual in nature. You can lust and covet things that have nothing to do with physical things at all. It can be a reputation. It can be a position. Uh, it can be wanting to see your enemy uh, getting it in the neck and rejoicing over it when a Christian falls or fails or messes up and those kind of things. That's all a part of the world. It's not just rock and roll music and it's not just bad television and movies and, and it's not just an illicit uh, uh, love of going to the dance club at night and, and those kind of things like that. That's all Hollywood stuff. The world is the carnal desires of this world, the carnal ideas. I wrote this down. I need to make sure your, your supreme affection eventually determines all of your decisions in life. Your supreme affection. You know what the Lord said? Sex your affections on where? Not where moth and rust doth corrupt. Why does He say that? Because your affections wind up driving you. You serve the idea that dominates you. Somebody's out to get you. 
you serve that idea. Then when somebody says something, you're right off the bat. You know that you know they're out to get you. You serve the idea that dominates you. You fashion yourself after your own idol. I doll, idol. You fashion yourself after your own idol. Third thing, fourth thing, eventually some great truth or lie will captivate you and or dominate you and bring you under its spell and from then on your decisions will be based on your loyalty to that idea that has dominated you. Hitler, dominated by his idea. Stalin, Lenin, Bloody Mary, dominated by their idea. You want it a little closer to home? All your political figures nowadays have an idea of what they see or what they want to do with a country. And you know what they do? They're dominated by the idea. And therefore, everything that they do in life is dominated by that idea. They have what you call an agenda. It's an idol. An idea can become an idol. And then you get yourself into trouble. You say, what happens? You know what you do? You depart from the Bible and its teachings unless you can use the Bible to support your idea or your idol. If you can't find in the Bible relief for doing what you're doing, then you don't want anything to do with the Bible. For instance, if I'm doing something that I shouldn't be doing, I love the verse that says, He hath given us all things richly to enjoy. Right? You know, well, preacher, you know you've got to have the right balance. You've got to have the biblical balance. If you say the right balance, it's dominated by your idea of what that balance is. That's one foot in the world and one foot close to Jesus. It's a fence riding position. You know what the Lord said about that position? I wish you were cold or hot. I can't stand a fence rider. Biblical uh, uh, balance is different than worldly balance. Worldly balance is always making the idea, the thought that I got to make room. I'm only human. I'm just a person. I'm not God. Uh, okay, but you can be like Him. I can do all things through Christ that strengtheneth me. It's funny how we find the strength to do the worldly things we want to do. But Sunday morning, we're too tired to pull out of bed and come to church. But we can pull out of bed tomorrow and get to work, you know, because we're industrious. And, and, we're, and preacher, I've been working for 40 years. I've never had a sick day. Well, suppose the Lord pulls out your sick leave up in glory and says, My goodness, man, you were sick nearly every Sunday. It must be terrible. How come you were only sick on Sunday? What's the, what's the deal with that? You took another sick day? You, you know, burned up all your sick leave. You don't get any pay for sick leave. Because you burn it up. I think I'm going to take a sick day. I'm entitled to it. A sick day means you're sick. Well, everybody else does it. See the worldly thinking? See, you know what a Christian say? I can't take a sick day. I'm not sick. Ah, well, don't worry about it. Just, you know, get a doctor's note. Tell everybody you're sick. <laughs> I'm sick, you know. I'm really sick and that kind of thing. Be careful. You might really get sick. And then you wish you hadn't lied about it. One of the things you have to understand about worldly ideals, worldly thoughts, and worldly pleasures is, is that Demas along the way had been looking at that world and thinking about that world the same way that Eve had been looking at that tree over a long period of time. And then before long, you know what? The straw that broke the camel's back, Paul winds up in prison and Paul's looking around there. Listen, I am now ready to be offered. The time of my departure is at hand. Look at the context. And Demas hath forsaken me. You go a couple of verses after that. You know what he says? No man stood with me. You know what he said? Their pressure came and they had already made the decision. You say, why? He had departed long before Paul went to prison. But he just said, I've had enough. I'm out. I don't know what it would take to kick you out, but if the Bible's right, the Bible seems to indicate most of us would go after the world before we go after the devil. We wouldn't go after Satan. But according to this, I'm trying to help you to see something. He's in church every time the doors are open. He's with the greatest preacher of his time. One that is no question anointed by God. He is with Dr. Luke, who is a theologian as well as a medical doctor who is traveling with Paul. He is among the who's who. When he walks into town, you'd think Princess Diana just pulled up. I mean, Paul's here, man. Well, who's around Paul in the entourage? He'd be like one of the apostles, one of the twelve. You know what I'm going to show you here in Matthew 26? You couldn't imagine it. Here's the Lord. He gets betrayed. The Bible said, and they all forsook him. They all forsook him. You say, yeah, skin for skin, all of the man hath he give for his life. You say, well, they ran. Well, why did they run? Well, 
The world teaches you take care of yourself. God teaches you let me take care of you. Let me just show you a couple of things here to give you an idea so that you understand. You say, well, you're kind of spooking me a little bit. Well, I intend to spook you a little bit. I intend for you to recognize that no matter how close you are today, you're literally one step away if you start converting or, 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 or conversating with conversating. If you start having a relationship with the world, it won't be long before that world will suck you right in. And before long, you think, oh, uh, it'll never happen to me. It'll never happen to me. And that one thing will happen and you'll be out just like that. And never to return. You say, having loved that pleasant world. Well, you know, they're a little carried away, a little fanatical over there, a little bit too much of the King James Bible's the authority and a little bit too much of, you know, living your life for Jesus Christ. I mean, you know, man's got to have room to live. Man's got to have liberty to do this. Man's got to have liberty to do that. Did you ever think about that statement? Did you ever think about when you get to heaven that all those worldly thoughts and ideas won't make a difference anymore at all? That you're going to spend your whole time in solitary confinement. You're going to be with Jesus. Whether you like it or not. You never thought about that, did you? It's kind of like, well, you know, well, if it's not important, why does he let, you, let that be your eternal sentence? <laughs> Most people get saved nowadays, and they get saved and use it as fire insurance. And then they wander in the wilderness for the entire time after they get saved, and they stay out there in the wilderness and stay halfway between Egypt and Canaan, and they just don't want to make any sacrifices. They don't want to make it, they don't want to trust the Lord, they don't want to step out by faith. They're just happy right there where they are. And you know, well, you can go into the land of giants. Well, we went over and surveyed that, but man, then people are big over there. And you know what I mean? I mean, that might be a better place and all that, and it might cost something. We might have to fight to get it. But you know, what's wrong with this ride right here? You know what the Lord said? He, for 40 years, He lets an entire generation die in the wilderness because they didn't want to go. Amen. You know what you see Christians do today? They wind up out there, they're saved. Some of them sitting in church in the wilderness, just wandering in the wilderness, just wandering in the wilderness. Never crossed Jordan. Never had the cloud up above them go through what's called like a baptism. Never walked over there. A couple million people cross over to the other side. Never fought a giant in their life. Never wound up taking a mountaintop. Never wound up enjoying the grapes that are over there and the milk and the honey that flows over there. More importantly, never inheriting what God wanted them to inherit. Amen. You say, why? Loved right where they were. Yep. That's it. Walked in circles, the Bible says. Yeah, but preacher, you know their shoes didn't wear out. So you're thinking God's blessing the fact that they're walking in the wilderness because their clothes don't wear out and their shoes don't wear out and they're getting manna and they're getting quail and you're looking at it and you're going, well, yeah, God's blessing them. No, God's tolerating them until they die. And then He offers a fresh crop. He says, now, you want to go to Canaan or not or I'll let you die too. You know what He'll do with Christians? He'll do with Christians like He did with Demas. See you later. Acts chapter number 13, the Apostle Paul's coming along there. I'll get there in just a second. I've got a lot of things to say to you this morning. Acts chapter number 13, the Apostle Paul comes up there. There's a boy there by the name of John Mark. And Paul gets off the boat there and he curses a guy with a, not, not, not foul language. He, he uh, 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 makes a guy lose his eyesight there because the guy's standing between him and what God wants him to do. And John Mark steps back and says, hey, Paul, that seemed a little harsh to me. I just, I think that's a little bit rough. Now, if you're going to be doing stuff like that, you know, Paul, I, I, I can't, I can't hang with that. I just, that, that just seems intolerant. I mean, these people around here think something's wrong with you. And if you're going to do that to people like that, you know what happens? John Mark steps out. And a little bit later on, or about Acts number, chapter number 20, they're making a decision on where to go. And Paul said, leave John Mark behind. You say, why? He ain't on the same page. He's more interested in what his agenda is than what God's agenda is. And instead of saying, preacher, what'd you do that for? And asking questions, he said, preacher, my opinion is you're too rough, too harsh. And for nine years, that boy stays in the wilderness. Nine years, John Mark would have been the Timothy. Nine years, he missed sitting with Paul like Demas. You say, why? Love the present world. Love the preservation of self. Love popularity. Loved a religion that got along with everybody. Loved a religion that said, hey, everybody's right and everybody can be, nobody can be for sure. Love that kind of a religion. You know what Paul said? Leave him behind. You say, yeah, but when Paul was dying, you know, he said bringing him, he's profitable for the ministry. He obviously learned from it. But you jump immediately and miss out on nine years, 360 days a year. Nine years that boy could have been sitting there with Paul learning. Nine years that can never be recovered. 
Nine years in the wilderness. Love this present world. I preach this is just ridiculous. It's just crazy. I know people that are like that. I know people. It doesn't matter what the reason is. But it's a worldly reason. They've lost sight of eternity. They've lost sight of the judgment seat of Christ. They've lost sight of standing in front of Jesus Christ and giving an account for the things they do in the body, whether it be good or bad. They, whatever their reason is for getting out, it's a good reason to them. The people that died in the wilderness, it was a good reason. They died in the wilderness. They were going to die anyway. Wouldn't it be better to die in Canaan than in the wilderness? I think it would. Wouldn't you rather be uh, over there in Canaan and saying, yeah, I, I, Uncle, uh, Uncle Bobby got killed over there trying to take over these giants and all that kind of stuff. Sure, I'm grateful for what he did. Wouldn't that be a better thing to do? Yeah, Uncle Bobby died in the wilderness walking around in circles. Just walking around and never made a decision. He just, every day, day in and day out, same old thing, that kind of a deal. Yeah, we, we buried him over. Where's he at? He's crossed the river over there. Well, what's he doing over there? Why didn't you bring him with him? He didn't want to come. Love this present world. You said, preacher, you're, you're kind of uh, provoking me a little bit. I hope so. I hope you understand that no matter how close you are and how close you think you are today, you understand that there are people that have followed some of the great preachers in our lifetime and been around them and they're completely out of the ministry now and completely out of church now and they go nowhere and their families go nowhere and that bitterness has spread epidemically across other people because of what some of them, they were close at one time. Sunday school teachers, preachers at one time, soloists and singers at one time, in service at one time, doing all the things at one time. What happened? I love the present world. I'm a preacher, you know, you don't want to be so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. Okay, well, let's see how that plays out when you get up there. Lose track. Something's more important. The idea nowadays is, is when a kid graduates from high school, whether they do or don't go to college, to go ahead and get your college and get your career and go out there and go to work and get married and have a couple of kids and get you all this and that and the other. And then when you get on up in your 40s and go, come on back into church, you're going to die in the wilderness. You say, why? Going to church has to become habitual. You have to learn to do it whether you like to or not. You say, why? It keeps you from getting stuck in the wilderness. Keeps you from hanging out in the wilderness. You say, why? Did you realize the people in the wilderness all died in the wilderness except two of them and their families? Joshua and Caleb? You say, why? Birds of a feather. It won't be long before you'll be hanging out with the people that are hanging out in the wilderness. And you know what they're going to do? They're going to tell you, yeah, you ought to be in the wilderness with us. Yeah, I, the church, church did the same thing to me. Catholic church, charismatic church, Methodist church, Baptist church, or the Baptist preacher, this guy did this, this guy did that, this one did this and that other. It don't matter who the excuse is. Before long, you know what you'll find yourself? You'll find yourself out there in the wilderness with the people that are in the wilderness. Demas didn't go out there and stand in the wilderness by himself. Demas immediately found comrades. He immediately found the confidence of his... Demas, you did the right thing. I'd be jumped if I'd be hanging out with Paul. I mean, good not alive, man. You're hardly uh, able to, uh, 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 to eat anything. You're hardly able to drink anything. You're in threat of being in prison. Your life is being threatened. And instead of saying, man, what an exciting life. Yeah, you need to be over here with us. I mean, Paul, you know, he's a little out there. And if God was really on him, you know, I mean, I doubt he'd have trouble with his eyes. And if God was really on him, why all the opposition? And if God was... Really, that's how people in the wilderness talk. If this guy's really a Christian and giving and doing and living and all that, why is he laying in the hospital? How come he got sick? How come she got sick? How come she got cancer? If, I mean, if they're really serving the Lord, see, that, that just doesn't make any sense to me. That's wilderness talk. That's what people in the wilderness say when you get sick. You know, you're, you're sick because you're over there in church. You're sick because you read your Bible. You're sick because you pray. That's what they say to you when you're out there. You say, why? The world loves you to be with them. They will coddle you and care for you and take care of you because their own guilty, stinking conscience. To try to convince you that the trouble, you're like, no, uh -uh. the Lord put, them, put me in this trouble for a reason. What's the reason? I got no idea. I just have to walk by faith and not by sight. Well, I'm tired of walking by faith. Go, they walked by sight in the wilderness. They're like me. I get out in the woods sometimes and I get out there. I got one leg longer than the other leg. And I, I have to be aware of that. You say, why? I'll tend to lean left and I'll continue to walk left. And before long, I'm just making a big old circle. 
you know what happens to you? You get accustomed to that stuff and you love this present world. And the next thing you don't even realize, you love the people that are in the world. And I'll show you here in a couple of hours if I can get around to it, that when you do that, you're at enmity with the God you claim to love. Amen. You say, why? He does not have any God over him. Your God is yourself. Carnal preservation. My idea. My rights. I deserve my day in the sunlight. I deserve my time. Really. Somewhere along did you forget that we are put here for His pleasure, not our own? Somewhere along the line did you forget that we're supposed to be living to give Him pleasure and not to draw attention to ourselves? Somewhere along the line did we forget that we're here to do something for Him, that it's not about us? Well, unless you're hanging out with Demas. You know what Demas said? You know, every time we show up somewhere, they're all talking to Paul. You don't hear Luke saying that. Luke is the physician. You don't hear Luke saying, you know, Paul, I'm a little wore out with this. I'm the one with the stinking PhD in medical science, and I'm the one with the real live, honest to God, doctor's degree. And I'm the one that knows all about medicine and stuff. I mean, I'm so good at it, I can take care of you. And every time we show up somewhere, Paul, they always come into you. And you're always up there talking, Paul. And you're always up there teaching, Paul. And you're always writing, Paul. What about me, Paul? Luke never says that. Demas says that. Oh, I've been right here with you, Paul. Nobody said nothing about me and my suffering. I've been right there with you, Paul, the entire time. Nobody said anything about my writing. I mean, after all, I mean, don't you remember I was down on the street and led a guy to the Lord? Nobody said nothing about that, Paul. I mean, I was with you when the people were saved at that great meeting out there. I was standing right there with you. I was leading them to the Lord. I was taking them to the back. I was praying with them. I was setting them up. I was discipling them. I was ministering to them. I was pouring water on your hands. I was taking care of you. I mean, Paul, ain't nobody said nothing about me. Demas hath forsaken me. I haven't loved this present world. You know what the world says? You deserve your day in the limelight. You know what God says? He that is greatest among you will be the least. But it's tough, isn't it, Demas? Because the world is all about promoting yourself. There's all kind of ways to do it. There's all kind of ways, sometimes even making it look like you really care about something or somebody, but it's really just an opportunity for you to step in and, well, I was there because, you know, because of what? The privilege of being with somebody when somebody's passing away or doing a funeral and all of a sudden you see the real demons show up when their agenda is about what they're talking about and what all they've done instead of about the person in the box. It's nauseating. That's why real warriors rarely talk about all the things they've seen and done. I mean the real ones. Because they realize they wouldn't have come back if it wasn't by God's grace and the help of the brethren. They wouldn't be back. You know what they did? They just, you talk to them, they're like, and they were in the thick of it and they saw things and did things that you couldn't stomach if you knew about it. But they don't talk about it. You say, why? They realize it ain't about them. They didn't go over there and win the war by themselves. But worldly thoughts and worldly ideas become that way of thinking and before long they become your idol and guess what? They dominate you until they've got you in its grasp and then everything you do follows that line. I know what I'm talking about and I know it's true and that's one of the things that psychiatry is trying to fix. They know you are what you fixate on. Well, who doesn't know that that's got a Bible? As a man thinketh in his heart... So why does the Lord tell me I better have my affections instead of on myself? I better have my affections on things above. What's above? Oh, Him. Amen. Angels, Amen. principalities and powers, cherubim, seraphim, throne room, judgment seat of Christ, eternity. That, that's what's there. Not this down here. Who's going to win a political contest? Who's going to be in charge? Who's going to make it easier on you as a Christian? Who's going to give you the greatest tax cut? Thank you. I got two of them there. The rest of you are like, whoa, no, whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah, you, yeah. If 10 percent's good enough for the Lord, it's good enough for the government. Suppose the government took 90 percent from you. What's that to you? Keep you wanting to go out, wouldn't it? 
Wouldn't you want to leave? Why is everybody trying to make this world such a comfortable place? I'll tell you why. There's a lot of Demas in the pulpit telling you what you want to hear to make you comfortable down here because why it makes them popular. You think what I'm saying is popular? Preacher, don't you realize we got a COVID going on? We got a plague going on. We, we have so-and-so in the White House going on. China might do this and Russia could do that. And there's this going and that going and all that. I mean, preacher, you don't like kind of having loved this present world. So how do you know? Some of you spend more time with the news than you do a Bible. Demas. Why are you so interested in that? Do you really think you can look at that and analyze that? You really think you have the intellect to be able to tell when those guys are lying and when they're not? You really think you know the, the place they got their information from? You do think that or you wouldn't keep watching it. Well, I can handle it because I know what it really is. Well, you sure are smart, Demas. You got it figured out, right? Oh, I know what it really means. Yeah, it sucked you in. You say, why? Self-preservation, skin for skin, all of the man hath to give for his life. In Matthew chapter number 26, I haven't forgotten where we're at. In Matthew chapter number 26, the Lord's going through uh, being uh, taken there in the garden after they've been praying up there and they went a little ways and went into the garden to pray and he comes back, wakes them up three times and they don't, last time he leaves them sleeping over there and there's a rustle in the bushes and they come up there to get the Lord and the Bible says that when they come up there to get the Lord, all of them have forsaken him. You say, why? Uh, they'd rather preserve their life a little longer. I don't claim to know everything, but I know human nature enough but in myself to recognize I'll have a tendency to be self-protective with my own thought and idea about things instead of what the Bible says. That's a natural tendency. And when the Bible cross-grains me, I find out if I'm really dead or not. You know, in that fit of anger, when you're pitching a fit because you're justified, the Lord's like, wow, Demas. Having your day in the sun, are you? Letting your boss have it? Watch your testimony go out the window? You know what your boss thinks? You only use Christianity when it's to your benefit. You get to read the Bible or have a little uh, opening prayer or a little uh, blessing over a thing uh, so that we can recognize you as a Christian, but you just like the rest of us. You just like the rest of us. Push comes to shove, you'll dump him so fast, you'll kick him to the curb like a bad habit. When your God wants worship, tell me you don't kick him to the curb. Yes, when the God of self stands up and says, who do you think you... Yeah. What does the Lord do? And your response right now, I see it, it's on your head, you don't even realize it, it pops up on your head. <laughs> well, I'm not Jesus. Well, he says you can be conformed to his image. You got to have your rights though, don't you? Even in church, you got to exercise your rights, don't you? You can't bow and let somebody else have the limelight, can you? Do you think one for one second that God's going to let you go by unnoticed in heaven? Why are you so interested in being noticed here? Oh, little Demas in you? I already gave you Matthew chapter number 26. Look in Acts chapter number 13. Acts chapter 13. I, I told you now, I gave you a warning. I mean, I was trying to be sweet to you. I told you I didn't have sweet things to say to you. I realize we're under pressure tonight. I know what's going on, but I did give you a warning. And, you know, I, I, I did say to you, it's not going to be positive. <laughs> Acts chapter 13. I need your help not to be a Demas. That when I do what God tells me to do according to the Bible, that I have the support of you being behind me. Yes, you say, why? Amen. I have to watch myself. Right. Do, do you think I always want to be the armpit of every joke? Do you think I enjoy being talked about at dinner time? My wife made fun of. People talking about my family and what a shambles it may or may not be. You, you, think, I, you think that's... What's my natural tendency? My natural tendency is to kick all over the curb and do what I need to do to fix that instead of what the Bible says. So I'm, I'm just telling you, I need you. I need you to say, amen, preacher, I don't like it, but amen or oh me, it's still true. And at least I have a few people that are, that are with me. But I know my flesh. My flesh wants to be liked. 
it wants to be appreciated. It wants to use his words to facilitate my agenda. I have to be careful not to rest the scriptures to my own destruction. But if you think I get pleasure out of this, you're smoking crack. You say, why? Well, look around you in spite of the pandemic. For us, we got a good crowd here. But don't you think we could have about 10 times the size of this if I just use an oratory skills to maybe be a little bit more positive and change things a little bit and change the music and kind of, you know. Don't tell me you don't feel like Demas sometimes. Weeds always grow faster than the real thing. You go out and you look at them beans every day and you keep looking for them to pop up there and you keep looking for them to pop up. You go out the second day after planting them and weeds have done grown six inches. How'd that weed show up there? You go pull that weed out. I got you now. You go out the next morning and there's another weed. They always grow faster. There's always more of them. Acts chapter number 13, the Apostle Paul says in verse number 13, Now when Paul and his com company loosed from Pamphus, uh, Pamphus, excuse me, they came to Perga and Pamphylia, and John departing from them returned to Jerusalem. Look in Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15. Look at verse 37. And Barnabas determined to take with him John, whose surname was Mark. But Paul thought not good to take him with them, who departed from them in Pamphylia, and went not with them in the work. And the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder one from the other. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed unto Cyprus. Well, before you get all carried away, you better come to Luke chapter number 9. You say, well, but now preacher, you know, and he took him in and, and God bless his heart and all that. You're going to tell me now that Barnabas did right by accepting John Mark's wrong? Where'd you get that worldly thought? That it's okay to do wrong and get a chance to do right. That the end justifies them. Where'd you get that? That a grown man said to me one time, oh, well, preacher, you know, it's just so much easier to ask for forgiveness than it is for permission. <laughs> That's just how the world is, preacher. You say, why? He got caught with his hand in the cookie jar and he knew when he was doing it, he was doing wrong. And he got caught and he goes, well, I'm sorry. <laughs> Keep on laughing. You pinheaded sap sucker you you're making it look like Christianity is it's okay to do wrong to get a chance to do right God don't do wrong to get a chance to do right God will not do wrong to save a soul from going to hell God's not going to have a party in the church just to try to get people here in order to get them saved he is not going to do wrong to get a chance to do right you can't justify your wickedness, Demas, and then try to spin it and go, well, you know, I mean, I did go down there and they did have a party, but I, I led one to the Lord. You know, that's like the kid that was here that was always saying, his, his favorite verse was, I'm supposed to be all things to all men that I might win some. He was justified going to the topless club down at Jacksonville Beach down there and saying the reason he was hanging out there was he was trying to win people to the Lord. Some of you think, well, Oh, you know, okay, I mean, those people need saving too. And so it's okay for you to expose yourself to that? Well, if that's the case, I'll meet you down there this afternoon. I'm sure nobody say anything about a preacher being down there. I mean, I want to make you comfortable, you know, we're going to go have dinner, you know, you have a little wine with dinner, right? Well, just go ahead and pour me a little bit too. I don't want to make you uncomfortable. You won't tell a dirty joke? I'll, I'll, I'll listen to you. I won't tell the joke, but I'll, I'll listen to you. I want to make you uncomfortable. You say, what is that? That's Demas. That's Demas. Love in the present world is affectionate to the world. It's catering to the world. It's letting how they feel influence how you act. That's what love is. That's a strong word. It's not the agape and the filio. You don't need a Greek word to understand. He's talking about his affections. He is so affectionate toward the world, he dumped Jesus Christ and Paul. When, pre when tribulation and persecution wouldn't do it. You say, well, it never happened to me. You ever love the bitterness? Your bitterness ever pull you away from the Lord and cause you to wander in the wilderness? Little Demas there. 
If anybody had a reason to be bitter, Paul sure did. Well, Paul's different. That's Demas talking. Paul said, I'm your pattern. He said, follow me as I follow Christ. Do you find Jesus? If anybody would be bitter, it ought to be Jesus. His own creation's treating him that way. You never see him go the way of the world. He's like, I'd rather, have, I'd rather go home to be with my father than I would to pander to these people. Don't you know that the Lord could have had a, 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 a huge insurrection and had people follow Him and created a, a gigantic, a ginormous was the word I was looking for, following if He'd have just followed what His own folks wanted Him to do? You said what they wanted Him to do. Kick Rome off the throne, get the Gentiles out of the way and make Jerusalem the capital and take over and let them be in charge. That's worldly thinking. You've got to be in charge. You've got to be the boss. Nobody's going to run over you. Okay. Enjoy your time in the wilderness. I got a boss. You know what he does? He's constantly telling me what to do. Constantly. He don't ever back off. He don't ever, Lord, you know, I, I need to get a break. Okay, fine. I'll let you know when you need a break. He's like one of my old football coaches. I'm, I'm sucking air, man. I kind of, I'm thinking, I said, I got to have a break. He said, I'll let you know when you're tired. I think he would have driven me until I went into convulsions, you know. I'm looking red as a stoplight and that kind of a thing. They didn't have all the stuff they have nowadays. You know, you hold up a card or something and say, hey, I'm going to pass out. I realize folks have died. And all. That stuff happened back then. They just didn't advertise it. That happened in the military back then. In the military back then, they had at least 2 to 5% casualties in boot camp, not special ops training. They just didn't publicize it. It's part of it. It's war. People die. Can you imagine? You're going to go out and play football, you've got to be in shape, you know. So guess what? Bones get broken and nose get busted. And you wind up with your tailbone crack and your back messed up and this and that and the other. And, you know, you say, why? Because you're out there getting tight. That's part of it. It's part of it. You're going to go to war, guess what? You might get shot or blown up. You say, why? You're messing around with people that want you dead. <laughs> I think I'm going to go in the military because they have a great GI program. And once I get out of the military, I'm going to go to school and I'm going to go to college. And then they go, yeah, well, we're having a war and you're going. Mm -hmm. You may or may not make it back for school. Right. Luke uh, chapter number uh, 9. Luke 9. I am not going to make the end of this. Folks, th this thing here, I probably should be preaching it for the morning service. And the reason is, is because it is so important for you to understand that the Christian life is a choice. I didn't say after salvation. I said you can be saved but not choose a Christian life. But if you're going to do that, the choice is always going to come down to what you want to do and what God wants you to do. Uh, you're in Luke chapter number 9. Look, if you will, please, there in verse number, uh, make it 61. Make it 57. It came to pass that a certain uh, uh, man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, son of man has not, uh, hath not where to lay his head. All right, so there you go right off of Jump Street. Uh, there's not a place for you to go. There goes your real estate. There goes your finances. You may or may not have money if you follow the Lord. No guarantee. Breaks the charismatic's heart. If God gives it to you, he's testing you to see what you do with it. Now, you folks are good givers. You're within about $85,000 of having everything over there paid for in the building to be freestanded. You've raised over a million dollars to get all that paid for. You haven't been to the bank yet. You're not in debt at all. The money's in the bank. Brother Holland came in $46,000 under 40, 40, oh, excuse me. <laughs> brother brother uh, Holland came in $43,000 under budget. And then in spite of the price increases because of the virus and stuff like that, you're within just a little over $85,000 of being free cleared and the building's freestanding. I don't mean it would be completely with the windows in it and all the other stuff, but that's how far you've gone. So you're good givers. But you know what uh, Dima says? Me first. It's an oddest thing in the world around here that you folks have continued to do what you've done in spite of all that's been going on since March of last year. That's just, that's just a, it's, a, it, it's an oxymoron. It's, it's an oddity. It's strange. 
a hyperbole, I think is the word you use it for. Look in verse 59. And he said unto another, follow me. And he said, Lord, I suffer me first to go bury my father. And Jesus said unto him, let the dead bury the dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. The Lord said, you got a chance to go now. Uh, you don't know whether that guy's uh, dad's dead right then or he's going to wait for him to die. It doesn't say. But look how baby Jesus responds. I'm giving you a chance to go preach. You know what Demas said? I'm worried about my reputation. What are them people going to say if I don't go to daddy's funeral? What are they going to say? They're going to say you chose Jesus over daddy. Boy in the south, boy, that sure. Do you feel a tension right there? Boy, I mean, um, you talk about, oh, now wait a minute. I'm just, I'm just reading you the Bible. Jesus said, let the dead bury that. Go preach. You mean preach is more important than burying your... Well, that's what he said. If that's what God calls you to do. Look in verse 61. Another also said, Lord, I'll follow thee, but, first, but let me first... Go bid them farewell that are at my home at my house. And Jesus said unto him, No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. He said, What is that? That's the double-minded man unstable in all his ways. What is that? That's a man who puts friends above Jesus. The people at the house of the Lord said, If you go back over there, if you go back to your old way, if you go back to your old company, you know what you're going to do? You ain't going to follow me. I already know what's going to happen. I talked to a young man just the other day and he was talking about, you know, he got out of a bad situation and he did his time and that kind of a thing. And he called me up and asked me to call him. I called him and uh, uh, he said, I, I'd like some advice on what I need to do. He doesn't live in the state. And I said, OK. I said, uh, well, what's going on? And he started telling me about where he'd been and the amount of time he spent in prison and this and that and the other. I said, okay, I'm not interested in that. Where are you now? He said, well, I have a job and I'm doing this. I said, okay, I'm going to give you two things right off of Jump Street that are hugely important. He said, okay, I'm listening, preacher. I said, okay, number one, you need to find you a good Bible-believing church, one where the preacher isn't afraid to tell you white's white and black's black and because I said, you need straight preaching. Amen. I said, because you're a con man, you're going to recognize a con in the pulpit. Amen. He said, well, where do you find that? I said, well, you don't find it sitting in your living room flipping channels. You've got to get out there and go looking. Amen. I said, number two, and as important as number one, don't go back to the old crowd. Amen. I said, are you in the same city you were when you got in trouble? He said, yes, sir. I said, move. He said, well, you know, I mean, I, all my connections are here. I said, the right connections are the ones that got you in trouble. Did you not learn anything in prison? I said, you've been sitting over there for a little over 10 years. Now you're out. You're asking me. I've been around the block enough to know two things are going to mess you up. Number one, you need to change how you think. You need to be under a Bible-believing preacher and listen to him teach you what the Bible says. And number two, you've been with the wrong crowd. He said, man, I realize I'd have to move. And I said, well, if you don't move, they'll move you. He goes, what do you mean they'll move me? I said, they'll move you back to prison. I said, they decided where you went to prison. Did you get to put in a choice when you got found guilty? Did you say, I want to go to Tuscaloosa? I didn't told you where it's at now. Did I say, I want to go to Tutwiler? I want to go uh, to such and such and this and that and the other? He said, well, no, they just sent me where they... I said, exactly. You know what they're going to do? They'll tell you where you're going to go. Don't go back to the company. You know what the Lord's saying to you here? I'll close this and we'll finish it up tonight. Hope you'll come back tonight. Amen. You know what he says here in this particular passage right here? He said, I know if you go back to that old crowd, you ain't going to follow me. You either follow me while you've got the chance, step out right now, and let's go. If you don't, your finances, your family, your friends. You know what Demas says? Those things are important, man. Tell me he doesn't. You're raised more nowadays on how to make a living than you are how to live. I don't care what kind of living you make. If you don't know how to live and how to handle the making the living, it ain't going to do you anything but damn you. You say, why? It'll become your idol. Father, bless your word and help us uh, this morning to at least consider these facts that are found in the Bible. Help us to understand that you tell us these things for the reason of instructing us, of helping us, of guiding us and of directing us. It's not to try to hurt us or to harm us, but to keep us out of harm's way. And Lord, help us not to be that Demas. Help us to recognize that we all have him living in us as much as we have Judas in us. We'd ask, Lord, that you might take these things and teach us the, these things and use your book as a schoolmaster to bring us to the knowledge of you and help us, Lord, not to depart from you, especially in these last days. 
We'd ask now you be with us in the upcoming service. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.